Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. So, basically, um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, more or less like a decision model. So, for me, there was this little conundrum that artificial intelligence is getting everywhere, right? Everywhere in your private life, everywhere in your banking life, everywhere in your technical life, and uh, within in your organizations. So, but the issue for me was a little bit that how do we get everyone to be an AI expert? So, who of you has read over 200 white papers about artificial intelligence? Okay, we have one person. <laughs> Excellent, I think Helena, right? <laughs> yeah, perfect. So we have one person in the audience who, who will check, uh, fact check what I'm talking about. So th the issue for me was that how can we maybe come up with an AI decision model that fits on a single page, that helps you to come up with a decision if you want to use or be subject of an AI, right? So. And I try to make it in such a way that it is non-technical, which is, of course, not good for this audience because you're all technical. But that was, for me, the, the, the main thing. How can we come up with a decision model that fits on one page where the different stakeholders from compliance, legal, information security, citizens, users, and so forth can follow that discussion, right? So, without further ado, this is the page I came up with. So don't, un don't fear to, that you have the need to understand it straight away. I'll talk you through it step by step. But, well, as, as I said, my goal was to put it all in one single page without you know, having the need to read 200 uh, white papers on, on artificial intelligence. So let me quickly walk you through it. And um, afterwards, please feel free to, to have discussions about it and, and please approach me, whatever. So, for this to work, I needed to do a really hardcore simplification. And the hardcore simplification I did was a genera generalization of a model. A model, so basically AI tries to replicate something in, in reality, is training applied to data and algorithms. So those are the three main factors or main three stages that we uh, can talk about, right? So once again, simplified model, but I think it works 90% of the time. So it's a data plus algorithm applied with training, and then you have a model of your real world example that you want to do. So therefore, I came up with this picture where I said I put machine learning, artificial intelligence, however you want to call it, you put that in the middle. And the first thing I'm expecting from someone who's developing an AI or machine learning is that he actually defines a goal. What does he actually want to achieve with that? And an argument to say, because I can, is for me not a goal, right? That there, there should be something behind it. What do I actually want to achieve with that machine learning? So. Let's assume we have uh, a monitoring system that allows you during a job interview to monitor the candidate to give you an indication if the candidate is a good one or if, if the candidate is not a good one, right? So then we have a defined goal and we can say, okay, let's use um, machine learning for that. The first step is then basically I draw these little red errors to follow these red errors and come to conclusions if you want to go ahead or not. If at any of those stages a red flag is, is, is thrown, right, you kind of look at it and say, okay, let's have an understanding if we want to go ahead, if we find a way around it or if we can do something. Even if you're a vendor, this model might help you to give transparency to your customers, right? So, the first things first, let's make a decision if an application should be attached or not, right? Just because of a machine learning and I have a lovely data lake to swim in, uh, well, um, it doesn't mean that you need to apply or attach every application possible there, right? So the first decision is actually, do you want the application to, to be part of it or not? Then the next thing is, it says input here, 
you decide what kind of input is allowed from that application into your machine learning algorithm, right? So do you want to allow new data streams to be entered or do you want that to be sanitized? Do you want that to be um, ambiguous or do you want the, you know, prompt engineering? Do you want to be capable of um, filtering what kind of prompts can actually be put there? So we go from the application to the input to the machine learning. So then we have the first stage, if that is okay. And then coming back to the model, I have the division between data, algorithm, and training. I did that a little bit, oh, that's on the top left here. Um, so the blue part is a little bit um, ethical I issues. Uh, the green part is a little bit more um, legal issues and the yellow part is more logical topics. So let's come back to this. We're now going to the, to the green area, so the legal topics. Most of the machine learnings that you will encounter will have training data, test data and validation data. Of course, there might be some others, but with those you're kind of okay to verify if the data that you're having is actually legally yours, if you can actually use that. Coming back to our job interview, right? You, you, you're making a stream of, uh, of multiple people, but they might not want you to have those data, right? So they can make uh, a judgment call if this data is actually yours, if you can legally use it for that purpose and make it clear to the, to the contestant or to the job applicant um, how this is going to be used. So if you say, okay, for the training data and for the test data and the validation data, we have a green light, then you can go back and say, okay, the data section has a green arrow, it's all good, so we can go on. The next step is then for your technical geniuses who can then gain an understanding about the algorithm. So just to highlight it a little bit, you have algorithms like dimension reduction, regression algorithm, recommendation algorithm, clustering um, uh, rhythm, um, algorithms, and classification algorithms. So if you talk to your vendor, he might not be willing to give you his, his actual code, right? He might not allow you to go into, into the specifics. But you can at least ask him what kind of algorithms he's actually using. So let's assume someone has uh, came up with a lovely application that predicts stock market prices, right? If the stock market prices are in any kind of val uh, valuable, right? They're most likely not in a classification algorithm. They're most likely to be in a regression algorithm because that shows you how the data sets are structured and what uh, a possible evolution of those data sets are. So if someone comes to you and says like, well, I have implemented that and that algorithm, you can make a judgment call if that actually is useful to you and if that is actually according to the goal of the, uh, of the machine. And of course, I made a little extract here on the generative AI, so all the lovely, beautiful, large language models. So if your IT specific guys or your data scientist guys say like, okay, what they told me so far in regards to the algorithm, it makes sense. So I think we can go ahead from a, from a logical perspective. Then you can jump back to the machine learning. And once you're back to the machine learning, you can then go to the training part. Once again, I tried to highlight the most likely training methods that there are. Of course, there, there, there will be others soon, uh, but with those four, you're, you're probably on a safe side to, to make a judgment call. So let's look at them a little bit. So we have reinforced learning. Basically, if any one of you has a pet, a dog, for example, right? He did reinforced learning anyhow, right? He gave the dog a little bit of a treat when he did something right, and he didn't get a treat when he did something wrong. So this is reinforced learning. Then we have supervised learning. Supervised learning means that there, a human is looking over it and making a judgment call. And then we have the opposite of it. We have unsupervised learning, meaning 
that there was no influence by, 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 by a human. And then, of course, we have the, the semi-supervised, which is basically taking up more and more space. So currently, one of the most is supervised, but um, semi-supervised is getting uh, quite tremendous um, topics. So the more the human is integrated into the decision making, the more you might have the issue of human bias, right? So once you, um, you do supervised training, it will always be the intention or, or the, the, the thinking of the human who enters that. And therefore, you kind of need to look out for that if there is certain human bias, right? Um, that can also be true, of course, for data selection. Um, also there, human bias might be um, a possibility. So, reinforced, semi-supervised, unsupervised, um, supervised. They're, they're, they're tremendous um, topics, especially unsupervised, um, where the machine is left alone and it's giving the chance to actually identify something new. So there has been large, um, um, especially in the, in the medical terms, there has been large um, exercises going on where they try to identify new types of cancer, new types of uh, everything. And it was done in such a way that it didn't include any su human supervision because that basically did a little bit of a damage, or not a damage as such, but a misdiagnosis. So once we have, have that and say, yes, we are, we are happy that there is um, the right amount of um, human bias being en uh, encountered, and we are absolutely okay, so then we go back to the learning, and then we come back to the machine learning uh, corrected with the goal again and then there's the last path is the decision so is the decision done by the machine or is the decision done by a human right and for interesting topics is that the faster the decision is needed the more likely it is that the machine makes the decision which is an interesting topic because a lot of military need fast decisions. So in military decisions, nowadays we see more and more applications that do not have a human intersecting with the decision. Let's go to an easier example again. So earlier I was talking about the, uh, the, the candidate who goes to a job interview, right? And he gets, um, he gets um, uh, videotaped uh, during the um, during the job interview and you do all the micro uh, expressions, you try to identify if the, if the candidate was lying due to the micro expressions or if he was thinking and this kind of things. So then we come to the decision and the decision is then, do we rely purely on the machine learning to, say, uh, to tell us, yeah, we're gonna hire this person or not? Or is there human interact uh, interaction? And the human interaction is also heavily needed if you are in a, in a critical sphere. So, for example, if you do the same thing for, for um, if you want to apply with your bank with a credit, uh, credit card, right? This approval must be justified. And if there's no man, uh, no person involved in the decision, it might actually be that um, those um, credit card applications and so forth are, will no, not hold up in law. So, basically, on one page, you have something that you can hopefully give your users, you can hopefully give your different uh, uh, apartments in your organization that you can work on in society to say, okay, let's go through this decision path and if everything is going ahead, then why not use the AI? One of the reasons I think you need to apply a decision model is that whoever tries to apply an AI policy in this organization will most likely need to update this AI policy on, on a weekly basis because AI is developing so fast, right? So I think it is much more 
interesting and much more likely to go ahead if you establish a decision model for the individual and decision model for the company than rather to go for some sort of AI policy. So and then you can ask yourself certain questions. I put a couple of questions here to say, okay, is, is the goal what we want to uh, achieve and all this kind of stuff. So you can read up on those uh, kind of decisions and come up, of course, with your own questions. And then you can uh, most likely implement it. Once you understood that model, it might actually be useful for certain other things as well. So I actually have prepared a second slide. It took me quite some time. Uh, it's nearly the same slide. <laughs> Sorry. So if you gain an understanding of that model, you might actually include that into your risk thinking. Right? So what do I mean by that? So if we go back to the three components, the training, the algorithm, the data, you can make then an assessment to say, does the attacker need to put more effort into that or the, the medium amount of effort into it or a low um, amount of effort in it? So let's say the likelihood on data. If the, da uh, if the attacker only needs to stipulate one picture and all of your 50 million pictures are all of a sudden not worth it anymore, then you have a situation where the likelihood of an attack is on the data because the attacker doesn't need to invest very much. So it's a simple thinking of economics, right? To say, where is the likelihood, um, low, medium, or high? And then you might want to uh, protect something here. Algorithms, it's the same thing. Um, who of you has heard of the sponge attack? Sponge Attack has nothing to do with the television series. Sponge Attack is that you can introduce code that basically soaks up all your, all your um, uh, computation power. So it doesn't do really much harm, but it more or less renders your application useless because the machine is calculating, calculating, calculating for nothing. Right? So Sponge Attacks. Really brilliant. Um, I, I really think that uh, we will hear a lot more when it comes to destructive testing um, for AIs. Same thing also for the training. If the training can be messed up easily, then um, you might want to look out for uh, being attacked on that thing. So it doesn't mean that you're only going to be attacked at a certain stage, but it gives you a certain probability where you might get attacked. So once you understand the model, it, you might be capable of using it for uh, multiple topics. Yeah. So what I recommend to you, be it a user, be it a subject of AI, be it a vendor of AI, come up with questions and answers for the different topics that will help you to, to, to gain an understanding, um, to give you uh, transparency to give transparency to your customers and try to work it out. Last but not least, I think it's always um, the topic of a society and organization and individuals. All of them need to play a part so that we have a safe future with AI. And with that and one minute 22 left, I would like to thank you very much. Please, um, I published this uh, on LinkedIn uh, with clear white pages, as you can see. Please use it and give me feedback if you find it um, any useful. So thank you very much.